I'm going to start with innocent uh, rhetorics to allow um, the people from the village to come to us and to join us for this last, very last um, uh, session in La Grande Alle before we get the concluding notes. Three days of uh, privacy, data protection, fundamental rights. And we have been very concerned as a programming committee about the Snowden affair, um, of, uh, concerned that it would uh, dominate, col colonize a conference that is supposed to be sustainable, long-term thinking, and very rich in content. And I think we did well. We did well in, in, um, <laughs> um, in fencing that um, the panels on that affair, on the, on the events that all, uh, are all on our mind, and are all, all over in the journals. But here's, the, here's then the, um, our gift to you, uh, the, a full afternoon on, on these topics that is uh, a Friday afternoon present. So sit back, relax, don't think critically, just enjoy. Um, you have been working really hard. You have been um, networking really hard, very late even and very early. So I guess a lot of people are, um, are satisfied with what they have achieved and are indeed hoping to relax. But I, I think um, this uh, last panel has the privilege of bringing together uh, at intellectual and political stakeholders of uh, high, high standing. And I'm very happy that uh, Giovanni Buttarelli from the EDPS um, is helping me out because I'm a small guy, but we need a real person to do this. So as a moderator, we have Giovanni Buttarelli. I'm very thankful that he's here that he finds time to do this and that he, like he did in the years before, with his natural uh, elegance and, his, uh, and his, uh, the swiftness of his reflections. As speakers, we have, first of all, Alex Joyle from the, uh, the, the pff, I, I three times asked, what, what are you really doing? It's a d data protection officer director uh, for the National uh, Intelligence Services in the US. Um, and we are very happy of, that he's here because we need, of course, to have, um, in a multi-stakeholder conference, to have all the um, different positions present. So thank you, Alex, for joining us. Then we have Casper Bowden, who is member of the scientific committee of this conference, is an independent privacy advocate, and is, um, as you all know, a very um, uh, a person having a lot of vision on where data protection should go. And he has helped us for many years, and I'm always very proud to announce him. Then for the second uh, time in the history of CPDP, my colleague um, Martin Shining from the uh, European University Institute. This is uh, supposed to be the, um, the center of intelligence of Europe. And when I look at Martin Shining, I realize that this must be a bit true. So I'm very happy to have you here and that you will give us your view on the, uh, on the, uh, on the EU responses to prisons. And then to conclude, we have a director of DG Justice, but from my perspective, a very important one, uh, Paul Nemitz, has been speaking at CPDB before and was very, uh, and I'm very happy that he accepted to be here again. So let's kick off. We have till quarter to five. That's one hour. Um, uh, Giovanni will uh, uh, moderate the panel, and there will be uh, only one PowerPoint from Casper. But I hope we see the Twitters back again because I really like the Twittering generation. Well, good afternoon um, to everybody. Um, as you know, uh, Paul Dehert is a smart, um, sparkling, and unpredictable professor. Um, I was expecting to simply play a role of moderator, but I, I was just noticed that I should uh, now improvise a new role of uh, co-chair moderator. So sorry for, I mean, uh, possible mistakes. Um, Massive surveillance um, is, um, was subject of uh, very other uh, panels uh, in uh, CPDP. This is why we are concentrating now on uh, the uh, expected EU response. Um, and therefore, we, we build on the uh, debate discussions of the other um, days of, of this <coughs> uh, impressive, uh, impressive event. Why such emphasis on, uh, on surveillance? Um, 
I think that uh, it, sh it should uh, be clear to <clears throat> everybody that in uh, the wake of allegations, revelations of large-scale electronic uh, surveillance, new uh, disclosures continue to uh, indicate uh, the existence of uh, surveillance programs of unprecedented uh, scale and depth uh, affecting uh, individuals, uh, public and private uh, entities, national uh, at national at uh, European level, so not only in the, in, in the US. So question is how much these uh, massive surveillance programs uh, lack uh, a clearly defined set of objectives, how much they are restricted to counter-terrorism uh, operations uh, or to selected threats, and therefore, um, without going uh, deeper into the detail of the uh, whistleblowing, uh, the emphasis is on uh, the compatibility of these surveillance programs with uh, uh, the uh, minimum democratic uh, rule of law standards, um, compatibility with security and fundamental rights of citizens and residents in, in the EU. Not speaking about trust that EU citizens uh, should have in their governments, uh, in uh, EU institutions, uh, in uh, safeguarding and uh, protecting their, um, their privacy. Uh, in July last year, the European Parliament has adopted a, a resolution on its own initiative demanding it, uh, the European Union uh, withdrawal from certain agreements, namely the Safe Harbor, the TFTP agreements, um, but also other, uh, on other initiatives concerning, uh, for instance, flight passenger um, information, uh, unless the US said, um, come clean uh, about surveillance. Uh, in late November this year, last year, uh, in a communication about these programs, the European Commission has adopted a different approach, um, and we'll come back to, to, this, um, to this point. More recently, the, the, the European Parliament is uh, um, discussing uh, the deadline for amendments for just yesterday, a draft report um, from Libe, rapporteur uh, MP, MP uh, Claude Moraes, and uh, there are some relevant uh, points to be, uh, to be discussed. Um, we agreed on a logic order of, uh, of interventions, and the, uh, I mean, the task to break the ice uh, is on uh, Alex Joel, um, Chief Liberties uh, Protection uh, Officer at the um, Office of the Director of National uh, Intelligence in the US. Uh, he's a special advisor to the director, I understand. And uh, we would like to uh, ask you, um, I mean, to basically uh, start by commenting recent developments in the U.S., namely the Obama speech, but also the recent uh, presidential uh, directive. Axel, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Giovanni, and also thank you to, thank you to Paul, and thanks to the uh, conference organizers for in inviting uh, me to speak on this panel. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, this panel, I think, is the, one of the very last panels on the last day of the conference. Um, and I would say that we've saved the best for last, but I, I, I've been told that every panel at the CPDP is the best panel, so I can't really say that. Um, we have had, uh, I have had many interesting conversations in my two days here, um, and I've learned a lot of very important insights, including my conversations with various uh, European Union officials. Um, I'm going to take back those insights. Uh, I, uh, very interested in understanding um, the European perspective and bringing that perspective back to the United States intelligence community. Um, it's certainly been a, a very interesting and very busy uh, last few months. As you know, last Friday, the President of the United States gave uh, his speech on the results of our signals intelligence review. He gave that speech at the, uh, at the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. And many of you have by now seen that just yesterday the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board published its report on the so-called Section 215 telephony uh, metadata program and last month, uh, as described on the last panel here, uh, the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies published its 300-page report and recommendations. So that's been a lot of work, a lot of reading, a lot of developments in the last uh, couple of months. And there's a lot of work 
ahead for us as well. But before I get to that, I did want to focus a bit on the President's speech and on the directive that he issued as part of that speech. This speech is, is one that we, and the directive, is one that we consider um, a very important one and a landmark one for the intelligence community. Um, he announced a series of very concrete and substantial reforms for the intelligence community, uh, very, very specific changes that we are directed to undertake. Uh, these included limitations on the, on the use of bulk communications uh, data and privacy protections for all person uh, personal information collected from signals intelligence, regardless of nationality. Uh, as he said in the Presidential Policy Directive, quote, all persons should be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of their nationality or wherever they, may, they might reside, and all persons have legitimate <laughs> privacy interests in the handling of their personal information. U.S. signals intel intelligence activities must, therefore, include appropriate safeguards for the personal information of all individuals, regardless of the nationality of the, of the individual to whom the information pertains or where that individual resides. Um, in order to really understand how that presidential policy directive impacts the intelligence community and what that means for our policies and procedures, I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining a little bit more about who I am and how I fit into that framework. So my actual title is the Civil Liberties Protection Officer, and I report directly to the Director of National Intelligence. My position was created in the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. It's a statute, statute that was passed by Congress in 2004. This is the same law that created the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. This is an independent office, and it's, it's headed up by the Director of National Intelligence, who's James Clapper, the current one. He reports directly to the President, and I report directly to Director Clapper, so you can do the math. Um, and uh, it's an independent office. It leads and coordinates all of the intelligence agencies in the United States. My main duty, as laid out in the statutes, is to ensure that the intelligence agency's policies and procedures include adequate protections for privacy and civil liberties. For example, my office uh, conducts, along with the Department of Justice, the semi-annual assessments of compliance by the NSA with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and we write up, those semi, uh, write up the reports of those compliance assessments on a semi-annual basis. The last one is, uh, that's posted on our website is from August 2013. Um, I'm part of a multi-layered framework of uh, oversight. There are lawyers and inspectors general in the departments and agencies that, that involve the intelligence agencies. Um, the men and women of the intelligence community themselves are uh, working hard to follow the rules. Um, the, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which just issued their report, is also part of this framework. It's a very, if anyone who's read the report, I think should not doubt uh, how independent that body actually is. And they recognized in their conclusion of that report the integrity of the employees working um, on, this, on these matters. They said in their conclusion, the United States, quote, is protected by men and women devoted to the rule of law. In talking to dozens of career employees throughout the intelligence agencies, we found widespread dedication to the Constitution and eagerness to comply with whatever rules are laid down by Congress and the judiciary. Uh, speaking of Congress and the judiciary, so we are also overseen by Congress. Congress not only passes the laws that we must follow, but also funds and authorizes our activities. So they have what we call the power of the purse. Um, they exercise very careful oversight over what we do. I know that there's been some people who have questioned the ability of Congress to carry out these oversight functions. In my experience, I find their oversight to be very, very careful and at a granular level. And they have staff and facilities that are clear to see information at all levels of classification. Uh, the judiciary, if you've seen the opinions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the previous criticism of that court was that it was a rubber stamp. I don't think that anyone who has read those opinions can now believe that they are a rubber stamp. They take their, uh, that court takes its responsibilities for oversight very seriously. But I want to talk a bit about the changes that are in the Presidential Policy Directive, PPD 28. This is a legalistic document that may has not, not have gotten as much attention as the President's speech. It is up on the White House website. Um, in it, there are certain uh, uh, changes that the President has ordered the intelligence community to take with regards to signals intelligence. And I just want to lay out for you a couple of those changes, a few of those changes. I won't go through the whole document in detail. Um, first, uh, this is something that 
Peter Swire mentioned in his uh, talk, it, he quoted from it, privacy and civil liberties must be integral concerns in the planning of uh, signals intelligence activities. It says that in the presidential policy directive. We absolutely do not collect signals intelligence to suppress legitimate criticism or dissent, stifle free speech, uh, benefit or burn persons based on their ethnicity, race, uh, gender, or religion. So that's laid out as a general principle in this directive. It also says that we will tailor our signals intelligence collection activities as much as feasible and consider uh, available alternatives such as diplomatic channels and um, uh, open source publicly available information. Fundamentally, the, the, the policy directive declares that persons should be treated with dignity and respect regardless of nationality or where they reside. So it includes that statement that I read to you earlier. And in section four, it lays out certain principles respecting the safeguarding of personal information regarding minimizing retention and dissemination and also going toward data security and access, data quality, and then strengthening uh, oversight mechanisms, calling for compliance incidents, for example, to be reported not only to the Director of National Intelligence, but also to the extent they concern uh, citizens of another country, for there to be a process by which the foreign government uh, could be notified. Um, I do want to also emphasize there's a different section uh, that talks about bulk data uh, that is collected for signals intelligence activities. It limits the use of any such bulk data to six identified purposes which are spelled out in the uh, section, section two of the, uh, pr uh, of the policy directive. Um, the, any data that's collected in bulk can only be used for those six purposes. It then contains, follows on with a second sentence says, that says it cannot be used for the prohibited purposes I mentioned earlier, it cannot be used to advantage a commercial, for example, for the commercial um, benefit of any U.S. company, it cannot be used to burden criticism, um, et cetera, or for any other purpose, only for those particular purposes. I'm getting some restless signs over here, so let me just conclude. Um, the, uh, um, in terms of next steps, there are a series of deadlines that are spelled out in the Presidential Policy Directive. Uh, there are 180-day deadlines, there are 12-month deadlines, there are requirements for us to post things publicly, requirements to enhance transparency. This is difficult for us to do in terms of enhancing transparency while also maintaining uh, national security secrets, but we are committed to doing it. We are being, going to be held to these deadlines, and uh, I, will, I anticipate that there's a lot of work ahead of us, and we will certainly be in contact with our colleagues here in the European Union as we go forward on these, on these changes. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, just a 30-second question to, uh, to you before you relax. Okay. Um, we, um, <clears throat> may I quote uh, it, um, again um, Claude Moraes from, from Parliament? He said that uh, the speech from Obama marks substantial step forward uh, with a substantial language. Uh, there are concrete assurances from the U.S., but perhaps he said... Uh, it may not suffice to restore EU citizens' trust. How do you react to this uh, preliminary comment? Well, I think it's uh, someone on the prior panel said that restoring trust takes, you can lose trust in an instant, but it takes a long time, a longer time to restore it. So I think um, it, it'll be a process. Uh, people have to fully digest, understand it. Um, there has to be additional um, transparency measures, uh, and we have to actually work through what the changes are going to mean in our policies and procedures. We have, our, we have a task ahead of us, even internally inside the intelligence community, as we have to go through and figure out how these changes in this presidential directive ripple down through our compliance structures, our oversight structures, our reporting structures. We then have this requirement to make those transparent to post that. I think as, as people see how serious we are in this process and how much time and effort it takes for us to go through this and how seriously um, everyone involved is taking it, maybe that will help with this trust, it is not just a speech, um, it's not a piece of paper, this is a directive by the President to the intelligence community to do these things and we are going to do them. Thank you, Alex. Um, in his quality of independent privacy advocate, Caspar uh, Bowden is very known to, to all of you. Um, I'm sure, Caspar, you will be delighted to, uh, I mean, start with your preliminary comments on these recent developments, please.
trouble. Uh, Good. Right. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to try and make my contribution quite, quite precise. Um, as many of you know, uh, I co-authored a report last year with uh, Didier Virgo and researchers from SEPS on the problems of cloud computing and cybercrime. And a large part of that report was concerned with specific provisions of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act passed, the amendment passed in 2008. And it drew attention particularly to the problem of this very severe discrimination of rights by the status purely of nationality. And the application of 702 to, for example, for cloud computing would be that if Europeans' data is sent uh, into the range of US jurisdiction, either by giving custody to a US company or by being sent to a server in the United States territory, there are quite uh, impressive statutory protections in that act for United States persons, which means uh, a US citizen or a legal resident in US territory. But for the rest of the world, there appeared to be no rights whatsoever, none at all. So after the Snowden revelations, um, and perhaps a little bit unsuccessful attempt to get some of my recommendations adopted by the, by the European Parliament in February, but it went a bit quiet after February, and then of course we had Edward Snowden. And I was invited by the Parliament to write a follow-up briefing note for the LIBA inquiry, which was published in September, and that is the report that Peter Swire referred to earlier. If you hadn't looked at that, um, I think it's still relevant, and perhaps uh, if you wanted to look at that and send me any comments, I'd still be very grateful for comments on that. So now, of course, we have had President Obama's speech and the accompanying Presidential Policy Directive 28. And n I, I'm impressed to some extent by uh, the, the tone and the character of President Obama's speech but I really want to dissect what I regard as being a fundamental problem with the provisions of the new policy directive from the, from the perspective of a non-US person outside the US. So the crucial term of art that I analyzed in the report last year was actually partly to do with the definition of foreign intelligence information, and particularly that section 1801-2BE, which says that foreign intelligence information, as well as taking into account all the things you might expect, like money laundering and terrorism and serious crime, it has this very political provision. Uh, this is not the one on the screen, but it's a, it's a different definition. But the one in, in, in FISA uh, essentially said that, that foreign intelligence information can be simply information about a foreign territory or for the pursuit of the foreign affairs of the United States. And indeed, in the very definition of foreign intelligence information, there is discrimination built in by nationality. So if you were a US person, it would be, have to be necessary. That information would have to be necessary for the pursuit of US foreign affairs. But if you're not a US person, it merely has to relate to the pursuit of US foreign affairs. Relate, obviously, being a very weak legal standard indeed. So turning now to the new Presidential Policy Directive 28, uh, it has a sort of slightly different term of art, foreign intelligence, which is expressly uh, stated to be the same as in Executive Order 12333. Now, this executive order uh, is done under purely presidential uh, inherent authority, and it governs the activities of U.S. foreign intelligence outside the territory of the U.S., which is, I think, internationally, essentially a lawless zone. There is no real international law dealing with this other than what you can infer from, for example, ICCPR, as referred to on the previous panel. So in, uh, in the... Get rid of that. In the new uh, Presidential Policy Directive, we have this definition of foreign intelligence, and you can see I've highlighted there that that can include simply information relating to foreign persons. So that's about as broad as you want. That, that essentially allows in anything. 
And then the structure of the directive is that section one deals with limitations on collection of information. And it does say, as Alex has referred to, uh, that the US shall not collect signals intelligence for the purpose of suppressing or burdening criticism or dissent or for disadvantaging persons based on their ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion, which is excellent. These, these would be heinous things. Uh, I am perhaps a little too long in this field to resist the cynical observation that does anyone think the NSA is currently self-declaredly doing collection for any of those purposes? In other words, there won't be a huge number of warrants or orders or instructions cancelled as a result of this limitation. I would suggest that in fact the collection activities will continue very much unchanged because it's nice to have this prohibition on collection for such purposes, but I don't really believe that any collection is being carried out in the NSA's own terms for these purposes self-declaredly. So section two, is about limitations on the use of information which has been collected. And again, as Alex has mentioned, there is now a long and exhaustive list of permitted purposes for the use. And I've listed them there, the, sort of, the font's too small, but it includes, for example, cybersecurity threats, threats to the US and its interests, uh, threats to the US and its interests in terrorism, uh, and so forth. And this does appear to be a real step forward in the sense that the earlier very, very, very broad purpose I referred to uh, in Pfizer, 1881 TBE, of merely relating to US foreign affairs, that's not in there. So in a sense, we, we have uh, achieved something here. The, the problem here is, is that this sounds great, but footnote nine. Footnote 9 says, this directive is not intended to alter the rules applicable to U.S. persons in Executive Order 12333, the FISA, or other applicable law, which might be existing law or future law. So essentially, the problem of discrimination of rights by nationality, which uh, was the subject of both of my reports to the European Parliament, that is going to continue. What we have now is that uh, Alex, in conjunction with the Attorney General, is going to have to draw up uh, a new regime of rules, which it stated, as far as permissible, consistent with national security, will apply equally to US persons and non-US persons. Uh, but these rules will only uh, govern the dissemination and retention of data that is collected. So we are still inherently uh, locked into a two-tier system where, a, if you like, a, a preliminary screen of civil liberties protections will only apply to U.S. persons, and then beneath that, as a floor, uh, we have this regime essentially about when this data will be got rid of and uh, how it may be passed around, including to other countries. And really, that's the very few number of slides I wanted to make on... Um, on the new PPD, but just very briefly to make uh, some additional points. Um, if we think about the implications of this situation from the, from the European Convention of Human Rights point of view, um, most of the cases that have occurred in the past 25 years have been decided on the grounds of the foreseeability and quality of law. In other words, individuals must be sufficiently aware of their surveillance situation, not to the extent that they can avoid surveillance, but that they do have, um, shall we say, an understanding of the world that they live in, in terms of the impingement of surveillance activities of the state or other states. So I think really what I would like to say is that the new regime instituted by the presidential directive can be changed in secret by inherent presidential authority. The executive cannot really bind the executive or future executive conduct. Only Congress can do that through legislation. So the regime that PPD 28 is, is creating might be reversed by the next president, it might be reversed by this president, and it could be done so in secret. And it seems to me that is intolerable and incompatible with any kind of foreseeability or quality of law that uh, would be satisfactory at Strasbourg. So in some sense, um, I don't think we're very much further forward in terms of achieving a resolution. 
I did also note, uh, and Paul will maybe want to comment on this, that the Commission issued a statement in response to the directive uh, saying that they welcome the limitations on collection. But, as I hope I've demonstrated, there are essentially no change in the collection regime. And that's all I'd say at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Kaspar. Um, will, will I have a chance to later clarify in response to some of the Yes, Kaspar's just comments? to say that, uh, I, I mean, wait. the issue uh, concerning U.S. or non-U.S. citizen is, of course, a, a relevant point, not, not the only one. I'm sure uh, we will have, um, I mean, time to come back to the uh, details you mentioned. The devil is into details. And uh, actually, Mrs. Redding, in a letter to uh, the Working Party 29 in uh, late August uh, um, reported uh, to the working party about the kind of force um, the Commission is making on this issue of the protection of you citizens. But I would like you to come back um, in the next round on, on so uh, this is a panel of mainly lawyers. I would like to see your impression on how private actors and internet giants are now reacting to the speech and, and, and to the draft uh, presidential uh, directive. Alex, you have 30 seconds before we give the floor. Oh, so, so I have 30 seconds to respond oh, yes. quickly? Okay, so um, so Casper, that was a very, actually very uh, helpful and um, uh, well-reasoned analysis of the of the PPD. Let me, let me just quickly respond. So the definition of foreign intelligence, fair point. I think it, it's a tautology to say that we're going to be giving uh, foreign persons, to use that phrase, and I know that that's not a helpful phrase to use in this context, but that's the phrase we use in the United States, right? Foreign persons, protections as the same as U.S. persons, but then have that definition refer to foreign persons in that way. So we're going to have to address that. So that's a fair point. Um, that's not, that was not some clever drafting trick uh, on, on the part of the, of the directive. And, I, and, and, on, and on that point, I'll just point out that the president had said in a couple of places in his speech, and we're definitely going to uh, uh, carry this forward, that we are not spying on ordinary, uh, ordinary people. So it's not... It really goes to the other elements of that, of that definition. And uh, I have other comments on the other things that he said, but I'll save those. You have a second chance. Martin Shining from the European uh, University Institute, distinguished professor uh, of international law, law and human rights, I think will be, um, I mean, happy to uh, approach the, this issue from uh, his own perspective, including perhaps some comments on the uh, international uh, response and perhaps uh, the political one as well. Thank you very much. I start by expressing a degree of hesitation, concern when Paul de Hert introduced me and the European University Institute as a hub of European intelligence because intelligence in this room has been used many times to refer to something else than academic excellence, but to make sure the European University Institute is an EU-level PhD training university in social sciences, an increasingly postdoc training and career boost institution. It's not related to any intelligence agencies, as far as I know. Other speakers have referred to their careers, so I will say one more line, besides being currently professor at the EUI, I served the United Nations human rights bodies for 15 years, first eight years as a member of the Human Rights Committee, and then six years as Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism. And both of these positions are independent expert functions. The Human Rights Committee was not chaired by Gaddafi's Libya. It is an elected body of independent experts, usually academics, serving in their individual capacity. I don't think there has ever been even a Libyan member. And the sole function of that committee is to monitor state co compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, which is one, of, one backbone, the backbone of what I'm going to say. The special rapporteurs are also independent individuals, but they do serve a political master, the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, which are both uh, intergovernmental bodies consisting of diplomats, 
from Libya or whatever country happens to be elected by other governments to uh, receive those reports we independent experts produce. Well, the question is EU response to PRISM or more broadly the uh, U.S. program on electronic mass surveillance through bulk collection of telephone and internet data for storage, processing, analysis and action. What is the EU response? Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that here we should deal with the EU not only as a body of law consisting of certain institutions and organs acting under EU law, but also as a political community. And this part of my uh, little presentation is about the political response. That EU as a political community is not only what EU institutions do, it's also what EU member states do. And much of that which should be done and is being done should be done at the level of international law, including at United Nations fora, where usually the EU itself is not directly represented. It is represented through its member states out of which the EU presidency usually speaks uh, on behalf of others. We were asked to address substantive issues in the EU response, and I think the substantive issue is and should be violations of privacy and other internationally recognized human rights through the mass surveillance. And this is a matter of law violation of public international law, including the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which includes a privacy provision in Article 17, which in turn is based, turn is based on Article 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We have the recent report by the uh, Civil Liberties Committee of European Parliament, which is a form of political response, but it also is quite clear in identifying violations of international law and condemning those violations in strong terms, terms in paragraph nine of its conclusions. It is true that Article 17 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights adopted in 1966 is fairly short and vague. It addresses as prohibited the uh, unlawful or arbitrary interference with privacy. That those terms may, be, may sound ambiguous, but they are no more ambiguous than prohibition of torture or the right to a fair trial. When uh, there is an, a massive program of surveillance on individuals on a global scale, including ordinary people not suspected of any wrongdoing, it is an arbitrary interference because it is disproportionate. And it is unlawful when it's not based on clear, precise, publicly available, and foreseeable uh, legal basis. Currently, I'm coordinating a FP7 project, EU-funded research project called Surveil, start, ending with an E at the end which comes from surveillance, ethical issues, legal limitations, and efficiency. And within that project, we are doing assessments of various surveillance technologies on the basis of scenarios. How is surveillance used in this situation? We started with a scenario related to serious ordinary crime, transborder, transborder crime involving uh, drug trafficking and violent crime. And now we move to working on a terrorism prevention scenario, which is very much based on the NSA and GCHQ practices. And what's alarming in this work, which is still work in progress, is that we get very low scores for what we call usability, effectiveness, cost efficiency of these methods, and very high scores for privacy intrusion, privacy and data protection intrusion. So it is um, quite likely that we will end up in a clear statement that these methods of surveillance are contrary to uh, the internationally binding provisions on privacy and corollary rights uh, because they are neither effective nor efficient and at they at the same time cause huge degrees of privacy intrusion, which will then amount as unlawful and arbitrary interference. 
I was very pleased to see uh, in the report by the review group set by President Obama that there was reference to Article 12 of the Universal Declaration and Article 17 of the ICCPR, and even a formulation which came close to a permissible limitations test, what principles can be derived from fairly abstract provisions on privacy at the international level. What was regrettable was that what was said in that report was more on the basis of moral argument than an acknowledgement of an internationally uh, legally binding norm. And here I'd like to refer to the uh, notion of extraterritoriality as a presumed limitation to states' human rights obligations. When the ICCPR was drafted in 1950, Eleanor Roosevelt was heading the US delegation and saying, we need this clause. Rights are guaranteed to people within the territory and the jurisdiction of the state's parties. Because we cannot be expected to legislate for Germany and other countries, even if we are the occupied country, occupying power. She was, of course, right. The occupying power is not supposed to legislate, but it's not supposed to violate either. And this is the problem, that today certain governments, including the US and the UK, seek a pretext to violate human rights abroad under the excuse that those people who become subjects to the interference, intrusion, or violation would not be within their jurisdiction. The matter has been clarified in the early case law by the Human Rights Committee in Uruguayan cases in the late 1970s and early 1980s, or a French pension case related to French pensions in Senegal, so that the question of jurisdiction is not about the location of the individual, it's about the causal connection, how the actions by a state cause the affected individual to be denied of the enjoyment of his or her human rights, or a direct violation by the state in question uh, of those rights. We were asked to address tools. How many minutes? Two. Two minutes, three tools. As tools in the response, um, primarily based on the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, I would like to refer first to the possibility of interstate complaints. It's high time that the EU member states bring an interstate complaint against the United States for privacy violations of their citizens mm -hmm. and of citizens of the world. 20 EU member states, as well as the United States of America, are parties to the procedure that allows for interstate complaints. True, the United Kingdom is one of them, and maybe it should be on the other side of the table, together with the US. Second tool, the same Human Rights Committee, which is an independent expert body and was never chaired by Gaddafi's Libya, <laughs> uh, that will deal with that interstate complaints, also happens to be considering periodic government reports of the US and the UK in this very year, 2014. In March session, the US, and in July session, mm -hmm. the UK. And these provide opportunities for the NGO community and other observers to pay close attention to how on the global level an independent expert body makes an assessment of the events that have surfaced. Tool three, do we need a reform? The Libe Committee, gives its support to the adoption of a new additional protocol to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that would address e-privacy as a corollary to the traditional privacy rights. I think this should be discussed, but it should not give the impression that we are in a legal vacuum, that there would be a gap. The current problems can be addressed under the existing generic provision on privacy, there is um, a legal provision which provides teeth in the form of complaints and consideration of reports. Uh, the only sense of having an additional protocol would be to add something more to the existing framework. I see much more urgent that the Human Rights Committee uses this opportunity to draft a new what's called a general comment, a codification of existing practice and uh, 
a codification of its own interpretations, which have the capacity over time to become recognized as subsequent practice that clarifies the understanding of the treaty and the legal obligations of states under the treaty. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, the legal analysis is indeed uh, a key element of the discussions on the EU uh, response. This explains why the Article 29 Working Party, with the support of the DPS as well, is, uh, is, is investing a lot of energies on the reflection about the application of necessity and proportionality principles uh, with regard to the uh, law enforcement activities. And, and the emphasis is uh, largely on existing um, legislation. So thank you for, for uh, this comment. Before giving the floor to, um, to Paul, um, I would like to draw your attention to the explanatory statement, again, of the pending uh, document before uh, LIBE. Um, with regard to uh, five, um, the title of this uh, panel is the EU response to, to PRISM. Um, the explanatory um, statement uh, lists uh, five uh, reasons not to act as EU and five reasons to, to act. Uh, in the first group, uh, you will find the assumption that there is no EU competence, that there is need to, I mean, take into account the danger uh, of the whistleblowers, um, the lack of their legitimacy, uh, the existence of a sort of a realistic uh, realism uh, argument uh, in the sense of uh, importance of generic, uh, general strategic uh, interest, but also the need to trust your, uh, your governments. And therefore, in the list of the uh, opposite five reasons to act as a uh, European Union, uh, there is a question about, um, I mean, the mass surveillance uh, argument. Uh, so in which so society do we want to, uh, to live? The fundamental right uh, argument, close to the, to the legal uh, analysis, the EU internal security uh, argument, uh, the lack of uh, uh, an oversight uh, system, and finally, the chilling effect on, on, on media. Um, against this, uh, I mean, background, I would like to ask you, Paul, of course you have your, your speaking note, but <laughs> I, I think everybody here is um, reflecting on, uh, I mean, where we are in terms of a degree of trust and cooperation uh, between EU and US transatlantic partners. So how much uh, we may be reassured by recent developments in the, in the US. Do you agree with uh, the current comments? Please. Thank you, Giovanni, for uh, this question right to the heart of the matter. Let me say, <clears throat> first of all, um, the Commission has uh, uh, reacted manifold uh, to uh, the revelations in the United States right in July we have started uh, what was called the EU-US Working Group on Data Protection to better understand uh, facts and law. Um, and I think this dialogue was, was very useful because uh, we had uh, regular consultations with Robert Litt, uh, the key lawyer who uh, together with uh, Alex Jones wor works uh, in the Directors of National Intelligence Office. And it helped us to understand um, what uh, the legal basis are uh, in the way uh, often also Kaspar Bauden uh, is criticizing or presenting them, we, I think, had to catch up there. Uh, but it, I think, also um, transpired to our American uh, colleagues that we have valid concerns to express through the questions which we were asking. And um, so when I look now at the speech of the president and uh, the policy directive, I see uh, that this dialogue, together with uh, the clear pressure from the European Parliament, from civil society on both sides of the Atlantic, from the big industry, which has also joined the train, I think all of this together has had an impact. And um, my feeling is that uh, this is not the end of the impacts. Uh, this is the beginning. Um, there is much uh, work ahead. And this is indeed also uh, what the Commission has said in its immediate press release on uh, uh, the Obama speech. So you can see that if we react within minutes uh, with a press release, you know, um, um, we are onto it. 
and uh, neither Mrs. Redding nor indeed myself are known uh, to be softies on uh, privacy and fundamental rights protection or for that matter in our uh, talks uh, with the United States. We use clear uh, language and uh, in contrast to what uh, Kaspar Bauden reads um, into our press release, I commend to you um, uh, the, the comment uh, of the press release and the reading of the press release by, by Simon Davis, the, the privacy surgeon, who gave it an extremely uh, tough and, and uh, uh, even rejecting interpretation. I wouldn't go that far, but, but we didn't say we, we are content with how uh, the um, U.S. president uh, addresses collection. We say we welcome uh, the uh, willingness to begin to address. Willingness to begin to address. And that's exactly, I think, um, what our message is. We see willingness, we see good principles, and now we have to uh, concretize together uh, these good principles um, into real change. And uh, honestly, I think we should give uh, the US, the American president, American dem democracy, um, American science, American free speech, um, uh, American tradition of uh, civil liberties, we should give them a chance. We should give them a chance to regain trust because I must say, I have he heard from many people and I'm convinced myself, Americans, they cherish their freedom. They cherish their liberty. They have a great constitutional tradition of defending these values and we share these values with the United States and the United States also has real economic interests, billions, maybe one hundreds of billions of profits are at stake in this big game uh, about uh, NSA activities. So I think all of this mitigates for keeping up the dialogue, and some way may say keeping up the pressure, but also giving a certain hope and encouragement and uh, uh, constructive work uh, 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 with the United States a chance, and this is what we will be doing. If you ask me uh, what is the response from now on uh, of the European Union, of course, uh, we watch very closely the developments in the Parliament. We take that very serious, that the Parliament is calling for suspension of uh, um, uh, the um, safe harbor and the other agreements which we have, and uh, intends to uh, basically not uh, move on, on on TTIP if no good solutions are found on privacy. We take very serious uh, the discussions in member states um, where we see increasingly a search, let's say, for a creative search for pressure tools on the United States. We have a number of member states which are now discussing exclusion from government procurement. And we uh, believe that the work of the Article 29 group, the group of National Data Protection Authorities on this uh, matter is, and its orientation is good. We have two data protection authorities in Europe which have rejected complaints um, um, relating to NSA activity with, I would say, very weak um, arguments which do not square with what I'm hearing from uh, the W29. This was the Irish um, 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 Data Protection Authority and the Authority of Luxembourg, and everybody can make up their mind what the deeper reasons, uh, the bigger reasons behind these rejections may have been. Um, so I think um, the pressure is on, it will stay on. We are starting now to work on the updating of the safe harbor. The commission has said if uh, uh, this is not possible, suspension uh, and revocation is an option. But I am hopeful that uh, in the spirit of the speech of the president, who holds out equal treatment, who holds out protection, and who holds out special deals for special friends, and let's realize the safe harbor is a special deal for the United States, Europe is making because we have no safe harbor with any other country. I am hopeful that um, um, with this orientation, this new orientation of American politics, um, we can reach uh, uh, progress, and of course this progress with the United States also has to be accompanied by progress within Europe. This is where I want to 
uh, end my remarks. I think uh, also in Europe we have to do homework. I'm very interested in what is happening in before the European Court of Human Rights, um, uh, the uh, action which has been brought against uh, the British activities, and it seems, that's what I read today in the papers, I don't know more than you, it seems that the European Court of Human Rights gives priority to this case which comes from uh, Great Britain. Um, the Commission has sent pre-infringement letters to a number of member states, and we do not share the opinion that everything relating to what national security authorities do falls outside union responsibility. Let me just end on this note. The jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice, EU Court, Luxembourg, not Strasbourg, is very clear. The court says, if a member state invokes national security reasons, it is incumbent on the member state, the burden of proof is on the member state to demonstrate that the measures which it intends to take or has taken are justified and are proportional and necessary for national security reasons. And it is up to the national judge or for that matter of the commission as the guardian of law in the European Union to examine this proportionality and necessity. And therefore it's not good enough to come back to the Commission and just say this is not your matter, this is national security and we're telling you nothing. There is an obligation of loyal cooperation between the member states and this means that the material must be provided to come to an assessment of uh, these activities. And I would say, and here I refer to a book of already 2006, of a German PhD, of uh, someone who's now a colleague of mine in my directorate, Satish Suhl. Suhle, he wrote in 2006 a book on spying and EU law. In German it's called simply Spionage. And in this book he laid out the limits under EU law for spying of member states on each other, on each other's companies, on each other's institutions, on EU institutions, and on the people of the neighboring state. Let's be clear about it. At this stage of integration in Europe, we cannot seriously maintain that it is necessary for national security and proportional that one member state spies systematically and in terms of bulk collection on the people of the member state next door. And in the same way, that this is not proportional in the European Union. We are of the opinion that bulk collection, indiscriminate bulk collection of data of innocent people who are neither related to government powers nor in relation to whom there's any type of suspicion of wrongdoing or links to wrongdoing whatsoever can never be necessary and proportional for national security. And this deep conviction, which is supported by jurisprudence in Europe and also what we have heard um, by international law, is the basis for the dialogue with the United States. Um, as you have seen in the presidential order, the president lays out limits for the time being on purposes of use, but he also says you must develop technologies to move away from bulk collection. And before you turn to bulk collection, you must exhaust all other possibilities. And I take these other possibilities for you know, gaining knowledge, gaining intelligence, public sources, and I read this also as targeted activities. So I think the science of the time is clear. The times for mass bulk collection in an unrestrained fashion are over. And now we have to concretize this that it's over and uh, find ways to rebalance in the spirit of uh, the Peter Swire report, the great principles which are set out in this piece of literature which will go down as his, in history, I'm sure, to rebalance the different risks 
into a real, realistic policy mix. What are the different risks? Risk to security, risk to liberty and freedom of action for security, risk to the economy, risk to political relationships. All of this needs a holistic approach and not only on the principal level, but also on the operational level. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you have a right uh, to an ex post uh, introduction uh, to those uh, who are not familiar to, to you. Uh, Paul Nemitz is a director at the Directory C on uh, Fundamental Rights and uh, Union Citizenship of the European Commission. Thank you for your um, comment. Uh, we already have a, a 30 second question in the loop for Casper about the internet giant's uh, reaction. I would be grateful, Paul, if you uh, come back in, in uh, <clears throat> the debate with your um, expectations about the impact of the recent developments of the, on the negotiations of the umbrella uh, agreement with the US. Now we would like to open um, um, I mean, uh, the, uh, the debate uh, by saying that um, against uh, some uh, concrete uh, signals um, from the US side uh, going towards uh, a positive uh, direction to be now translated into substantial uh, developments, we continue to have on both sides different feelings. For instance, uh, from some uh, US law enforcement bodies, the motto uh, we, um, we do not spy um, honest citizens, we are serving them. On the other side, uh, from the European side, serious concerns about the uh, impact of these um, activities on our fundamental right um, framework, um, invasiveness, uh, which is so huge to, um, I mean, uh, um, drive the parliament to suggest, to introduce, in addition to the data protection package, a sort of a European digital habeas corpus, and, and to work on an idea of a, a, a European uh, cloud. So it means that there are still problems to be solved. Who would like to uh, break the ice with very short questions of no more than 20 seconds, 30 seconds, so don't make statements, but, but simply short questions to hopefully one speaker only. Please. Microphone is coming. Who is next? Uh, waiting for the microphone. And my question is for uh, Mr. Nemitz. And the question is, uh, what are you going to do about member states that would like to... Uh, Could you identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry. My name is Walter van Holst. And my question is for Mr. Nemitz, what, would you, what are you going to do about member states that now say, um, we want to do bill collection too, because of all those nice toys the NSA apparently has? You want me to answer right now? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, um, as so often, uh, you know, the progress of, uh, of the law and of uh, the uh, moving promises of fundamental rights into reality uh, you know, it needs uh, different actors and there are different ways forward. Uh, one thing is, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, may, rather sooner than later, uh, uh, take a view on this. Uh, you know, some people were very cynical when this action was brought from the uh, UK. Uh, namely, they said, well, there are 100,000 cases in the docket of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, let's yeah, let's not, worry about, uh, let's not worry about this case. Well, those have been proved wrong. We will probably very soon see um, um, uh, results in this case, and this would be a first step uh, in the right direction. And as I said, in the European Union, um, we believe uh, there are limits which can be deduced from European law, namely from the principle of loyal cooperation between member states combined with specific legal acts uh, and specific principles of the treaty, there are limits to spying on each other's people in bulk between member states. And I would like to see politicians in member states and saying, no, for national security reasons, we must have the unlimited freedom to spy on the citizens of our good EU neighbors, honestly. I haven't seen such politicians yet, so I think this issue can be solved in Europe too. 
in two seconds. Paul, how do you see the negotiations on the Abrella Agreement? Easy waters, difficult waters? Yes well, or not? The, the, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yes and no questions are always unfair. As you know, Churchill answered, well, you know, if I have to answer yes or no, I ask you, have you stopped beating your wife? Yes or no? So I don't like yes or no questions. Um, the umbrella agreement is on law enforcement. Let's not confuse this. Law enforcement, police cooperation. It's not on secret service NSA activity. Now, is there a link towards, let's say, uh, the general positioning of, of uh, the US uh, government to equal treatment of non-Americans in the way we grant it in Europe, by the way, you know, just to recall this, we grant equal treatment in all respects uh, uh, to, 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 non -American, uh, to Americans and, and other people, you know, uh, in all respects which are relevant to our subject. Um, yes, I think there, w there is a link because if the US uh, intends to regain the trust of its partners, I think in the present climate we should also be able to move on um, uh, on the umbrella agreement and, and show that in this exercise of state power area, this is what it is about, the great heading, um, uh, we are able to agree on something. Thank you for, for being brief. Kaspar, be very short. We have two, three minutes more. One more question from the public. So um, I think turning back to Paul, it is fair to recall that at the conference last year when I made my PRISM present, or we didn't know it was called PRISM then, but the presentation, you said, Casper, if what you say is true, thousands of data protection officials all over Europe must be wrong. That cannot be. So perhaps I could actually ask a question of Giovanni, uh, the moderator, um, to say without speaking you know, as a representative of Article 29, but how is it that since 9-11, there is no reference in Article 29 opinions to Pfizer, there is no reference to the concept of foreign intelligence? And I think perhaps one could say the same of EDPS, uh, that there clearly is a function in EDPS to guard uh, European institutions and the regulatory function falling within the purview of EDPS against the predations of foreign intelligence agencies. How is it that thousands of data protection officials all over Europe did nothing about this for so long? Normally speaking, it's the moderator or the chair making questions, but I would be uh, so happy to answer to this uh, question, which I know is one of your um, I mean, killer applications you, you put everywhere. Um, I have a, I mean, the, a pleasure to do it. If you have a couple of hours, I may bombard you with uh, decades of references uh, present in all the documents from both uh, EDPS and N29. Um, and if I win uh, the discussion, you may pay a couple of dinner or lunches at your best uh, convenience. But I think we, in two minutes, it would be very difficult to, uh, to, to, do, it, uh, to do it now. I was um, impressed by um, this, this question, but I think um, there is a lot of um, answer, a uh, good answer to, to, to be made. Um, what else? The last question from your side. Yeah, Robert Cross, Trust and Account. For, for Mr. Joel, um, there, there is something like a Budapest Convention and the US hasn't ratified it. I've, I've seen your sincerity. Is this a room to to go into that direction for the United States. Uh, it's about harmonization of laws, uh, etc. Budapest Convention on Cybercrime is one. Um, so in all sincerity, I, I can't comment on that. I, I don't, uh, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, I'm sorry. Um. Any, anything else? I, I, I just want to say, I don't want to end, end, the, uh, end, the, end the panel with that statement. Um, I am, I am very excited about the uh, Presidential Policy Directive and the President's New Direction. We are excited about working with our European colleagues on a way forward to implement that directive um, and, and uh, realize that through our policies and procedures and, and enhance transparency. We understand that restoring trust is, a, is something that takes time, but the President has committed to it and we're committed to following his orders on this. And, uh, uh, and I look forward to working with uh, my European colleagues on it. Martin, why don't you make the conclusive uh, statement, please? The list presented to the panel ends with the question, what could be the repercussions if Europe 
puts up a fight against bulk collection and processing of data. I think the repercussion would be that other states would call to account European states for their human rights violations. And that would be a good thing. 